Welcome to the Fit File Podcast, where you're going to hear about anything and everything sports tech related, whether that's smartwatches, bike computers, bike trainers, train wraps, and basically anything that you can use to level up your health, fitness, and sports game. So I'm Ray of DCRainmaker.com, both on YouTube as well as the DCRainmaker.com site. And with me, I've got Des of DesFit on YouTube. All right, so on this week's episode, we're just going to go ahead and jump right into it. So we actually have a bit more to talk about than we thought we were going to have to talk about on last week's episode. So this week, we're going to talk about the new Apple Vision Pro. Zwift and Wahoo came out with their Kicker Core Zwift One Smart Bike Trainer. And ironically, Zwift also announced a big round of layoffs along with their co-CEO resigning. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and leave it up to you this week in terms of dealer's choice. So what do you want to talk about first today? We want good news first, bad news first. Mm, yeah, let's 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 do good news first. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we can go Apple Vision <laughs> Pro, or we can go uh, Zwift Hub, uh, Wahoo Hub One. Can you can you get it right the first try? Go. Can you get it the whole name first shot? No oh, no do overs. The Wahoo Kicker Core Zwift One. Ooh, good job. Yeah, I did not nail that later. in my video. Did did you? So many times I said it wrong, <laughs> um, but I just I simply shortened it to the Wahoo Kicker Core Cog, the the Core Cog basically. Th that um, that makes more sense, I think. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. let's just start there. Then. So since we since we're there, we'll start there, and we'll go to Apple, and then from there and back into maybe Zwift, and then uh, we'll see where we go from there. Um, yeah, sure. So. Wahoo announced with Swift their first trainer, um, being the Wahoo Kicker Core Zwift One uh, trainer, as you just nailed. Um, literally, it's like the, the parents that could not decide on a kid's name and just decided to give them all the names. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they may have taken some cues from Garmin at this point on the naming uh, convention. Even, I don't know, even Garmin's that bad at this point. Like, this is uh, <laughs> this is almost like old school elite trainer names. Like, we're talking like 10 oh, years ago yeah. elite trainer sure. names. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but they had like 21. I still have the brochure somewhere of like the 21 trainers I had, and it was oh. all like these horrendous names. Or like a Sunto, uh, but or like an old school Sunto name, too. Yeah. Yes. Like yeah. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Nine, exactly. Nine Barrow um, HR Stealth or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now, for those of you not familiar with what it is, they They've taken the Wahoo Kicker Core trainer exactly as is, like no changes to that trainer, except they removed the cassette on it and put on the new uh, Zwift cog, which goes on the side. That is a single cog. So I just put my IKEA plastic bowl demonstration away. Um, but essentially, you imagine like two plastic kids' bowls and then a single cog in the middle, meaning a single. Oh, I actually saw the cog right here a single one of these in the middle. Um, and this allows you to have virtual shifting. And the, the idea there being that it's compatible with pretty much any bike that you want to stick on it, as opposed to uh, up until now, if you sold a trainer, you had a cassette on there, you have the right cassette for each uh, bike type. So a 9, 10, 11, 12 speed cassette, which means that these companies had to spend a lot more money, not only uh, stocking those, but dealing with different SKUs and whatnot. So this really greatly simplifies things. Yep. And uh, this is basically came out of the evolution of Zwift launching their Hub One bike trainer. It was like mid last year, I believe, that they launched the, the Hub One. So that four was the. Ago. It was only four months ago. Four months ago to the day. Four months wow. ago. Okay. <laughs> the, the shortest trainer in existence, lifespan wise. Oh, yeah. We're going to talk about this whole. Yeah. We're going to talk about the very, very short history of the. Zwift hardware game here in a second too. So, uh, so yeah. So basically, this is the evolution, I guess you could say, of the Hub One, where they're basically transferring that concept that Zwift introduced last year to Kicker trainers. And if you're familiar with the whole bike trainer industry, you could probably see this coming from a mile away, considering uh, that Zwift and Wahoo settled their legal disputes late last year. Yeah, once they settled that legal dispute, which was over the uh, kicker, uh, really over the Zwift hub that started this whole thing, um, emulating the, or uh, according to Wahoo, basically infringing on Wahoo's patents. Uh, once that ball got set in motion and then it was settled this past uh, August or so, things escalated really quickly from a relationship <laughs> standpoint, right? <Yeah. laughs> this went from, we hate you, we want you to burn and die, to... Yeah, hook up tonight, done, right? Like it was, <laughs> there was no wasting time here. We've seen this on many different products over the last few months. First, it was uh, essentially pricing agreements. I mean, that's, that's what it was, whether or not they want to call it that, um, on their Kicker Core and the Zwift Hub being the same. Then it was Wahoo selling on the Zwift site. And then it was, you know, 
step, 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 step from there. Now the kicker, sorry, the uh, Zwift hub is entirely out of the picture. They've discontinued that. Um, so we can blunt that to this one for now, but they've discontinued the Zwift hub uh, series as a product. Uh, both the Zwift hub classic, which was the one that had the cassette built on it, as well as the Zwift hub one, um, which is the one with the uh, Zwift cog on it. Uh, and then from there, the kicker core effectively takes that place. The only good news, if you will, out of this whole thing, uh, not, that's not only good news, but the main piece of good news here is that the pricing remains exactly the same at 599 US dollars, I think also 599 euros, and I can't remember if pounds is 549 or not. Uh, and that includes the cog, the trainer, as well as a years of the Zwift. Um, so at the end of the day, after this entire legal thing, um, you effectively got a much cheaper Wahoo kicker by you know, a couple hundred bucks at least, uh, as well as a year's Zwift. So you're talking probably like a three to $400 savings um, after this whole thing was done. Um, the downside, of course, being that we've reduced the amount of competition in the marketplace as a result of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, just, I think Jet Black, unfortunately, is kind of a, uh, one of the bigger losers in this mm -hmm. uh, whole legal dispute that's that's happened. But I think a lot of this is going to just lead directly into the other Zwift announcement here in just one second. Yep. But uh, before we get off topic of the actual trainer itself, though, so... Let's talk about the actual experience using the virtual shifting and whatnot. And and quite frankly, like how excited existing core owners are to have this feature as well. Um, so this virtual shifting feature, you know, first of all, it does eliminate from the manufacturer end of things, a lot of confusion and a lot of stocking of like different cassettes, having to actually like source all of these and install them before they go out the door. But it also makes it easier for the consumer as well, where they can just order this one trainer with this one cog on here. And it works from any bikes with eight speed cassettes all the way up to 12 speed drivetrains. And it also solves some issues when it comes to one by drivetrains as well as smaller chain rings on bikes. So again, I think what was really interesting about this is how excited existing kicker owners were to be able to get this feature, which is cool because they're just gonna be upgrading the firmware so uh, existing kicker core trainers can get this feature in the future. Now, what does this mean for other kicker trainers like the kicker V6, kicker move, stuff like that? Yeah, so the, the Kicker V6 and the Kicker Move will be getting a firmware update very shortly. Um, they they didn't want me to tell the exact day it's coming out um, in case something changes at the last second. Um, but I would the best way I would phrase it is if you went off and bought the Zwift Play buttons, it might be a race as to which arrives first, right? That's, that's probably the best way to, to look at it. So very pretty much imminently going to happen for the uh, V6 and Move because it's the same physical trainer that the the move is simply a V6 mounted on it. Um, mm -hmm. And then they've also committed to adding uh, the same feature to the Kicker V4 and the Kicker V5. Uh, the timeframes for those are a bit more muddled. It doesn't sound like we're talking like next year or anything like that, or even later this year, um, but they're just working through that that firmware process. So that's pretty cool to see um, that virtual shifting there. And one of the things you mentioned, the, the benefit, of course, of you know having multiple uh, bike configurations is multiple users on the same trainer. Uh, meaning that, you know, like in front of me, there's a whole plate of bikes over there with different configurations. And some of them are uh, 12 speed and 11 speed, and there's even a 10 speed in there, um, and like two 10 speeds in there. And like the idea that you could swap between all those without having to do anything at all um, is a huge win for people that may be sharing a trainer um, amongst other users or just simply amongst their bike collection. Yeah, no, uh, I think when it comes to testing trainers, you know, I use a normal quick release bike for my trainer bike. And, you know, part of our testing process is that we need to test different bikes too on these trainers for comp compatibility. And like when I went to go put my 12 speed Eagle bike on any trainer, I'm just like, Oh God, I don't want to yeah. mess around with switching cassette bodies and cassettes yep. and all that stuff. So this just made it so, so much easier. It's definitely super easy. Now, the downside of this whole thing is that it only works with Swift, right? Effectively. So um, Effectively. there's two modes on trainers. There's, it's called sim mode, which is simulation mode, basically simulating the ups and downs of hills and whatnot, you know, gradient going up 5%, down 4%, et cetera. Um, and then there's so-called erg mode, um, which is your structure workup mode. Uh, and so people think erg mode, they may think trainer road, for example, but Zwift also does erg mode if you're in one of your structural workouts there. Um, so 
with this design, uh, the way you shift is using these little click buttons, which are just too far to reach to go grab, but this little button that goes in your handlebar and you can shift up and down using that. You don't actually shift using your shifters anymore, you shift using the buttons. But the buttons don't actually talk to the trainer, they talk to the Zwift app. And the Zwift app then effectively simulates uh, what the trainer should do from a resistance standpoint. So it's all kind of a bit of a mind game thing there. But that means that you can't use this with other apps that require shifting. So I can use the, or anyone can use um, these trainers perfectly fine in erg mode with Trainer Road, and I did that in review, no yep. problems at all there. Okay. Um, but if you wanted to use it with Indivelo or Ruby or MyWoosh or even Wahoo's own system app um, for the handful of pieces of that that are in sim mode, you actually can't do that. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty big bummer. Now, from the manufacturing uh, or manufacturer standpoint, I think... Other manufacturers have to be thinking about a manu uh, like a you know trainer specific solution, a hardware solution to this because I think again like you know this is becoming uh, a very popular uh, concept to to be able to have this more yeah. uh, universal compatibility. Yeah, definitely. And so I you know something I pressed um, Zwift on last year when they announced the Zwift Hub One. And I said, what are you going to do like? Myself and even my wife um, will use the trainer primarily in Zwift. Um, I use it a lot for trainer road, but she also uses for training of races full gas um, to simulate the race courses. And so in that case, she can't actually use this trainer for that. And so the idea that we could swap back and forth kind of gets gets sort of shot there. Um, so I asked Swift about that and I said their, their goal at the time was to be able to allow third party apps to eventually tap into that and other companies as well. Now, so we fast forward the four months or so and I asked the same question again and they said, yes, the goal now is to do it by the end of the year to release a uh, software development kit, API, et cetera, that would allow third party apps to go ahead and take advantage of that. Um, to me, that seems like an awfully long time to, to release that. I don't know, it just, just seems like a long time for me. Um, and given Zwift's history of releasing developer-focused things with uh, that history being effectively zero successes, um, you know, over the course of all the things they've promised all these years around development standards, none of them have ever come true, um, whether it be, uh, I mean, there's just a long, long list of these things. So I'm a little hesitant on that. And that's why my, my general advice with this trainer is, you know, if you're not sharing the trainer, then I would personally probably pick up um, the Kicker Core with a cassette instead, uh, because it gives you that flexibility to use any app that you want out there. So if you've got one bike, just pick up that with the cassette that you need for that one bike and you got one person on, et cetera. Um, if you're sharing amongst multiple bikes of different types, then this makes a lot more sense, especially if you're Zwift only. Um, but I just wish we would see better collaboration there from an industry standpoint, you know, kind of getting your point there. I think that's one of the challenges, I you know, we've talked about this in, in other venues over the years, how the loss of the Ant Plus Symposium, um, which used to be every uh, October-ish, uh, late September, um, wasn't just about Ant Plus. People often misunderstood that. Like, yes, it was on paper Ant Plus, but it was also in reality where every single one of these companies met and they, they talked about these standards and they pushed those standards forward over a bunch of beer in Canada. Like, that's how that industry moved forward for many, many years. Um, that's gone. And while these companies do kind of talk to each other, I know the tax folks talk to the Wahoo folks and talk to the Zwift folks and talk to the Leaf folks about these things. It is a very slow moving, very tangled web compared to what it used to be. And I don't know how we get back to that. It doesn't have to be called the Apple Symposium. It could be called whatever you want, um, but there needs to be some entity that can keep people moving forward on some of these standards so you don't end up where we are now, which is that most of these standards are falling apart. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Uh, yeah, you, you definitely see a little bit more divergence in terms of features and compatibility at this point. So yeah, I guess uh, in terms of this trainer, I think it's, uh, again, it's a really cool concept. I think what we probably can just lead right into though is the quite ironic announcement. What was it? Was it a day before or hours. two days? It was yeah, 24, 24 hours, hours before. So Zwift announced uh, on its own forums a pretty massive cut to their workforce as well as their co-CEO resigning. So to put context on the numbers here, um, Zwift officially would not say, but over the last, I'd say 48 hours, it's gotten clearer and clearer how big this is. And this is massive. Um, yeah. So we saw numbers initially. So Zwift had about 530-ish or so employees, give or take 50. Um, it's a bit unclear exactly where that number laid, but 500-ish uh, or so employees. Um, and you know, the first confirmation I saw from someone that I trust, I think you and I both trust very heavily, um, have put it at, quote, over 100. Um, 
And then I got another confirmation last night from an all hands meeting saying the number was 35% of the total workforce, which is <sighs> massive. Um, and this, this person, other person I got that number from, I trust more than almost anyone in the industry, right? So I know, I know that they know that that number is very, very real. And so that is a huge amount. So that would put the number closer to probably like 150, 175. And I haven't looked today, so we're filming this on Thursday. And in theory, at some time today, California should um, post their WARN um, uh, layoff announcement uh, database update for the week. Uh, well, they update every other day, so the one that matters here for our context. Um, but that will only show the California numbers. It won't show the global numbers. And we know there are people globally. Um, so, uh, But that'll give us at least a, a small peek into that. But 35% is a huge, huge cut, which puts them down to the... I don't know, my guess is 300s, upper 300s or so um, mm -hmm. for the company, give or take. It's a lot of people um, yeah, yeah. in a lot of different divisions. This is not just hardware. This is across the board. I mean, the most of the hardware people got let go a year ago um, when they exactly. first yeah. ditched their plans for the Zwift bike. That's really where this partnership with Wahoo is extremely smart. So they can just basically cut a lot of costs on the hardware end of, end of things. And at this point, um, they're not, they don't even necessarily have to have really much in terms of an R&D department in conjunction with Jet Black before, where you know they were kind of working together to make that trainer yep. a little bit better. This elim eliminates a lot of those costs. So it really was the smartest decision from Zwift's standpoint. But if you eliminate the hardware component to it, you know, you're just selling software and a software as a subscription model at this point too. Yep. So, you know, you have to look at where all the money's going because it's not like they have a small subscriber base and eliminating no i mean you know workforce is definitely one thing but you know you have to look at like where where's the rest of this money going and i think a lot of that is marketing and sponsorships yep yeah yeah definitely i think you know i the numbers that i'm you know i I've said you know, in the last few months that uh, the the SBA number is between like seven fifty and nine hundred thousand. I'm, I'm hearing it's closer to nine hundred ish or so, like the upper, like just below a million. If they haven't crossed a million, is the general consensus from everyone I'm hearing. Um, given that we're talking, you know, a reasonable amount of money, so you're talking roughly fifteen million dollars a, a month um, in, in subscription revenue, give or take, um, coming in, and uh, you know, then you scale that out, and obviously that's that's somewhat challenging when you look at having a 300 person workforce of high tech employees and generally well paid employees across many different um, expensive geographies, right? So California and Colorado and London and you know, you name these places that are all not cheap uh, from an employee standpoint. And, uh, you know, certainly marketing is a big piece. That's been a big piece of Swiss budget for a long, long time. And um, someone the other day kind of said, um, okay. you know, it's a, it's a big hit for Zwift to lose the UCI World Championships um, to my whoosh. And I kind of counter, I said, actually, I don't think it is. I think that was a, that was almost like a secret win there. Even though Zwift would, you know, wanted that World Championships, but I'd argue at this point, <clears throat> there is no marketing benefit in hosting the UCI World Championships in 2024 um, for Zwift in particular. There is probably for my whoosh a marketing benefit, but not for Zwift because in Zwift's case, Anyone who's going to watch that race, which by the way, if you look at the YouTube stats for the, the streams on that for this past year, so just under a year ago, was only 99,000 views on that video, right? So that is, I mean, for you and I, 99,000 views is a nice, nice day for video. But contextually speaking, if you were just to monetize that video, you're talking a little under a thousand bucks in revenue um, for 100,000 views, roughly like simple YouTube math is... 100,000 views is a thousand bucks, give or take, for this particular audience and demographic. It's worth a lot more if you're talking finance and worth a lot less if you're talking knitting, but simple math for you. And obviously their their goal wasn't to make money on that, that broadcast because they would have spent that in like 10 minutes on the number of staff they had involved there. Um, but there is no one watching the UCI Indoor Sports World Championships. Um, so we're not talking the rest, we're talking the indoor side of Zwift that isn't already aware of Zwift and probably already subscriber of Zwift. So you're marketing to the same people that you're, it didn't, didn't make a lot of sense versus the, the Tour de France of FM makes sense to me, the, the women's Tour de France there, because that is a title sponsor. So that's on every single banner across every billboard in France and other countries are starting. I think this year they're starting in the Netherlands. Um, that could legitimately 
have people look at that and go, what is Zwift? I've never heard of Zwift. I'm standing aside of a bike race. What is this Zwift thing? Look it up and, and maybe convert. Maybe not, but that also benefits women cycling and, it, and there's a lot of positives there. And so I actually don't think some of those marketing costs, like the loss of the, the UCI World Championships is that big a deal. And that's really where, in terms of Zwift's expansion or where they need to actually expand their audience, it's like, you know, cyclists, cyclists know about Swift. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's it's really more the, uh, I would say more like the Peloton style audience that they mm -hmm. really do, need to expand to, which I think the Zwift hub was uh, really a good step in that direction. So that's really where they need to expand the, you know, Zwift um, exposure, I guess you could say, to, I don't want to say non-cyclists, but, you know, people that don't live and breathe cycling all day long, which are all the UCI, type, you know, Zwift racing type people. Yeah. It'll be really interesting to see. I mean, that's, you know, if we start kind of going out further on this path is that, you know, Zwift had a valuation of roughly a billion dollars um, in the, their latest round. Um, so billion with a B, like boy, like there is no scenario left on this planet where Zwift will have that valuation again. That valuation was just after the kind of the peak of COVID where people thought there was a, you know, this is going to be something with many millions of users. And Zwift's user base has basically flatlined for the last, since COVID, essentially, since the beginning of COVID, since, you know, 2020 ish, it's flatlined. Um, and they've reached everyone they're going to reach at this point that wants to be on Zwift with the way Zwift is as a platform today. Um, and I start to wonder, you know, those investors, they're big name investors. We're not talking like mom, pa investors. We're talking some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley. And those are companies that are hoping to see return on investments that are 10x, 20x, 100x um, off their, their return there. And right now they're looking at like, if someone were to go buy Zwift, I would imagine it would go for a fraction of that. Um, you know, it wouldn't, certainly is not going to go for the, the latest fundraising round at 600 million. It would be I, I can't imagine much more than a, a couple hundred million at most, at most, right? I mean, that's just the reality because people know that that business isn't going to grow as it is today. They've seen the numbers, they know the numbers. So they that's been played out. So I wonder, will Zwift start to pivot towards, um, and I know Zwift people will hate this, but towards Peloton like breadth in terms of the content they have and the appeal they have. Um, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, it's something that I was at a, birthday party, surprise birthday party for a family member this past weekend. Um, and the demographic of that was um, 60 to 90 years old. Like that was a group there. And I was blown away with how many of these 60, 90 year olds had Peloton bikes and use Peloton bikes on the regular, like every day-ish, give or take. Um, and the, the core reason was simply that it just worked, right? And most of them had bought these used secondhand or on big, you know, fire sales from Peloton of the last couple of years. And so they're talking roughly a thousand dollars or less, um, versus while the kicker core, um, is 599 with as you know, years left included, and that's certainly cheaper than a Peloton subscription at 40 bucks a month. There's also the reality you gotta put a bike on there and you've gotta have a TV display on it. And like it just the and, 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 um, and you try explaining to a, a 76 year old or an 80 year old, like all this stuff and why it's not working. And they just say, it's, I'm not doing this. I'm just gonna buy something that works. And, mm -hmm. uh, that's what. You know, Zwift, I think, was going for with the Zwift bike back uh, a couple of years ago. And I'm not sure how they get to that, though, in some ways um, with the current product. Yeah. Uh, brings up a good point with the Peloton bikes is that, you know, I see Peloton bikes on the regular now in gyms. And again, yep. that increases their exposure. I have never once seen anything Zwift associated in a gym setting, which again, would just lead to that exposure that they would have there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think um, it comes back to like, you don't have, in some ways, the Watt bike, um, the Atom, yeah, the 2020, Adam, like with the, the screen yeah. built in or the Technogen mm -hmm. bike, things like that. Like, mm -hmm. um, Adam X, I guess it was. Uh, anyways, those those sort of bikes, like the Technogen techno bike, having Zwift run on it, which I know there's lots of complications there. Um, some of those Technogen, some of them Zwift, but that would have been the perfect scenario, especially given Techno Gym's breath in gyms, you know, even more so in Europe, but also coming up in, in the US as well. And that's where I just wonder, like you said, how do you expand that appeal to more people? And it's it's a very slow, slow rolling ball to, to do that. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure what other balls left they've got to roll. Yeah, exactly. So I wanted to actually loop back to the whole Zwift hub 
in my opinion, looking at where they are right now, I would have to imagine that whole exercise probably cost them a lot of money <laughs> in, in the whole scheme of things. Massive amount of money. Yeah. Ma- massive yeah. amount of money. You know, looping back to when the Zwift Hub was originally launched. So, you know, the, the term is they basically broke the internet when they launched that product. Because yeah. at that time, I think it was four ninety nine. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep, four ninety nine. Yeah. And, you know, they told me in the whole, you know, in the conference room where all the press were and everything like that, you know, like I, I think it was either me or Ben Delaney or something like that who asked yeah. us like, all right, so are you making money on this product? Yep. And they said yes, but you know what? I could have been 50 cents <laughs> at the same time too. And, you know, technically that yep. would have been a yes, but, uh, you know, that was... That's what in the industry you call a loss leader, where you know that's meant to sell subscriptions. That's not meant to make money on the product themselves. But you know, looking back at that whole thing, I think that strategy was good to bring in new customers who you know that didn't want to spend two thousand dollars on a Peloton bike. But that uh, strategy, I think, I think that hurt the industry. Oh, it definitely. It, it, it 100% hurt the industry. It helped consumers, but only briefly. Like most things, right? That um, when you see two companies get together, they they initially help consumers. And then down the road, we've seen effectively the loss of Saris as a trainer company. Like, I mean, no mm-hmm. Saris as an entity is still there and they get upset when I say that. But practically speaking, Saris is no longer a meaningful name in the trainer industry um, when it comes to these sorts of trainers. Maybe they're selling a bunch of mechanical $200 trainers somewhere, but um, no one is talking about the Saris H anything anymore uh, because that engineering team is effectively gone. They're, they were they were gone when the company sold itself off to a basically a brand portfolio holding company, and that ho- holding company has done nothing more than send out emails for the last year and a half. Um, it's like marketing emails, that's it. So they're no longer there. Um, Kinetic uh, has effectively gone away as well. So Kinetic um, was there. They were bought uh, by Magine and now run by Magine as a, as a shell company um, there. But there's no one left in, a, well, there's one person left in America, but there's no one left in that, what used to be an all-American manufacturing company. The same with, with Saris. Um, and I look at Elite and I worry, will that happen to them next? Um, and I think, you know, Elite makes great products. Like they, especially over the last few years, they've really matured in the products they're making and they're making really good products, but their cost structure is high compared to what, you know, the, the Wahoo Kicker Core is made in Thailand or uh, Vietnam or somewhere. Um, I don't think the Kicker Core is made in, in China anymore. I think it's in Vietnam or, or Thailand. But um, point is their cost structure is much lower than, than Elite's is uh, in Europe and, and their their overall prices too. And so... Um, while Elite gets close on pricing, it's very tough for them to get close on pricing in both Europe as well as the US. And then it's you look at those and a lot of people say, well, why would I buy an Elite Diretto over a, or a Suito over a Kicker? Um, like what is the, what's the driving reason to do that? Um, and I, I don't think Elite or even I or you or others have a good answer for that. Like it's one of those like, because Elite is Italian and we like pizza and pasta. I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't have a good, a good answer there. I just, the point there being that it's not good for the industry when we start losing some of these. We're basically going to be down to just Wahoo and, um, you know, tax left, Garmin tax. Um, and we know how Garmin will react to that. Um, they're just going to keep their prices high and they're going to, mm-hmm. going to keep on going. Yeah, no, and they're going to stay profitable at that point, too. So, you know, so right now, I think the expectation of a quality direct drive bike trainer around $600, that's the expectation amongst the industry, right? Or amongst consumers, I guess you could say, you know, that's going to be the price point. But what we have to look at is like, is that actually going to be sustainable for these companies moving forward? Because, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. Every consumer, all of us, we want the lowest price possible. But you know what? I also want the company to stay in business so they'll support the product later on down the road. Yeah. yeah. And I think it'll be interesting because to be clear, these trainers can be produced for 
far less than $500. We saw that even elite will say to themselves. And we're seeing that now with decathlon too. Um, decathlon started to introduce trainers in this realm. And uh, I've been chatting with a bunch the last few weeks and got some stuff planned there to probably get some of these in there and see if they're actually any good. And some of these are basically just, um, you know, manufactured variants of the Jetpack trainer, um, which is made by a different manufacturing partner in Asia or the Magine trainers, et cetera. Like those companies, they, they OEM models that are, are sent out for, many different entities and you know maybe wahoo will decide those violate the patents there but as we talked about i think in one of the previous episodes i don't think wahoo will sue again because i think wahoo got pretty well slapped by the judge in the, <laughs> the first patent trial that the judge basically said your patents are going to get revoked um mm -hmm. some of them anyways um over this and that they don't stand the ground they don't stand ground in terms of being you know legit so i'm not sure wahoo would be too eager to sue again because i just i think people will just uh, another company legal team would would basically fast forward past a lot of stuff and like mm -hmm. like the monopoly like just <laughs> go to there and move forward <laughs> at that point um yeah. so it'll be interesting to see and you know obviously wahoo does bring a lot of innovation to the marketplace i'm not saying they don't i'm not saying their stuff isn't um innovative or unique or whatever um but there is a difference between being innovative, unique, and being something that you can actually patent um, and have that patent hold water over a, a longer period of time. So um, yeah. it'll be interesting. I don't know what the solution is for all these things. Um, I think we are starting to see growth in the indoor trainer industry, um, but I'm worried that a lot of this consolidation won't actually benefit the consumer in the end. Yeah, an awfully exciting week in the world of indoor cycling. And I don't know, I, I would say at this point that Hopefully, things can kind of just settle down for a little bit, and uh, we'll just kind of see what happens this year. Because you know we're already in mid February when we're filming this episode, mid February or so. So, you know we're starting to all of us are starting to think about spring already. So uh, we'll have yep. to see how it pans out the rest of the year. So, so yeah, that's the Zwift Wahoo, their new trainer, and whole bunches of drama. So let's talk about <laughs> something on the completely other end of the scale, could be sort of related in the future, but the Paritas? new Apple, I'm sorry? Oh, not Paritas. Okay, not Paritas. Sorry, I thought we were talking Paritas. No, no, let's go, no, no. <laughs> we'll do we'll just better than Paritas. I Apples. see burritos. No, okay. I see burritos in my future. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> We've got burritos in the list here, so it's- Actually, uh, that- Either that, way. That, that does remind me, I have a free guac coupon from Strava, which we'll talk about here in one second. Oh, yeah, you're right. I signed up for that, too. I don't know. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. Better. Anyways, yeah. Getting back, getting back to it. Getting back to fruit. Yeah, let's let, let's see our fruit first, <laughs> then burritos later. <laughs> yes. So uh, let's talk about the new Apple Vision Pro. So this is their new VR, AR headset that enables spatial computing. So I have actually never tried one of these headsets before, just to give you an idea of my perspective here. But I went and demoed this yesterday at an Apple store and it was probably one of the most amazing pieces of technology I've tried in a long, long time. And I know there's the Oculus and a whole bunch of other products out there, but it was a phenomenal experience. But I didn't walk out the door with one either. There were some really cool things about it. You know, just the fact that, you know, you could obviously do all these different things. You could do, like have all these windows up. The control with your eyes was phenomenal. That worked so well for me. The finger gesture thing, that didn't... Um, that was a little finicky for me, but I think that's probably just take some practice or something like that. But yep. the coolest experience for me was the spatial photos. That was that was really, really cool to see. But the spatial videos. So to give you an idea of what happens here is like with the spatial photos and spatial videos, these are essentially like, you know, 3D photos or 3D videos that you're kind of like immersed in and the spatial videos an example i would give is like you know think about those like movies where you you have those characters that are like in the future where they're reliving their memories that's yep. that sort of experience and there's there's almost like something somber about it because you know a lot of those movies yeah. you know it's like this this person you know just like oh i don't know they they unfortunately lost their family or something like that and they're seeing their kids yep. run around there was like this somber feeling for me with with that yeah. sort of thing and then the last thing that i thought was really really cool were the immersive videos where very much the same yep. concept where you have the whole 180 degree view so like i said i did not walk out the door with one <laughs> what happened with you ray 
So what happened was, um, <laughs> so I wasn't really planning on, on getting one per se. Um, but then I wasn't also necessarily planning on being in the U S at the time. And then I just was there and I just showed up at my door. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, it's been interesting, like playing with it for the last week or so, uh, I guess last week and using a bunch of scenarios, using it both, uh, for implied fitness scenarios, as well as fitness scenarios that aren't really on the list of things you're supposed to do with it. <laughs> um, as well as just day to day stuff. Right. And, you know, I think if you've read reviews on it, you know, that, um, the, the general gist of it is that people say it's heavy and it is, it's definitely heavy. Um, uh, people say that it, it lacks a, um, a clear purpose, um, uh, like as to what the clear use case is for most people to use this. And I'd say that's generally true. There's clear purpose for what the device does, but whether or not that lines to what you as a person want. So like you can, as you said, you can watch, you know, 3d movies and immersive movies and, and you can make the screen feel like it's uh, people say like a hundred feet wide or whatever the case is. I'm not sure if I agree with that analogy as much, but it makes it like a big old screen. Um, and the 3D aspects of it, the immersive aspects of it, you, people have probably seen like this demo of the butterfly thing. It's just mind boggling. Like it's super, super cool. Um, and from a technology standpoint, it is fantastic overall. Like a geekery, like this is amazing. Um, I think my challenges are, and so it also passes through video. So you put this on and while you may think you're looking at something, there's actually cameras on the outside that are regenerating your outside view inside uh, the lenses. And you have basically two 4K lenses inside, and that just makes the whole world outside replicated inside again with these cameras. Um, and again, going back to this uh, surprise birthday party for old people that we're at, um, that I was at this weekend, uh, I had a bunch of old people try this. Um, and it was it was really cool to watch their reaction, um, like, you know, literally jumping away from things sort of thing. Uh, and it was, it was fascinating. I didn't really film much of it, um, partly because it was kind of late at night. It was all dark as whatnot, but it was, it was neat to see people's reaction to this, um, at least until we got to the price anyways. And, you know, it was just like, oh, wow, this is, this is incredible stuff. And so that was cool. And then I, I looked more like from a sports angle, like my goal was initially to kind of look at this from a sport fitness standpoint and what does it do in sport and fitness? Um, and there is effectively like three and a half ways apps get on this device, uh, in, in order of preference here. Uh, and it's really important to understand this, to understand the device as a whole. So number one is apps can get on, um, via the, uh, vision OS, which is sort of like uh, iOS or, um, basically an app platform. Um, and so you develop an app for this app platform. You have to custom develop for that. And there are very, very few apps in that realm. Like there's no YouTube app. There's no Netflix app. There's no almost anything app out there except for like Disney and a, a handful of other apps out there. It's, it's very, very few. The next layer is that if you have an iOS or, um, iPad app, those by default will be allowed to be installed on the device with some, you know, minor restrictions, but, um, you can just install any iOS or iPhone app as long as that company has not disabled access to it. So the company has to go and untoggle something, um, that is there by default. So, uh, we've seen, uh, again, Netflix untoggled their iOS app and, and their iPad app and YouTube untoggled it. And, uh, as did Strava and Peloton and Zwift and so on. Um, so then the next step down is, uh, you can take any app from your Mac and project it into the goggles. Um, so you can do that for, for example, Final Cut Pro or, uh, you know, any other app you want, even, even Zwift. Um, but when you start doing that, you get into latency quirks and just like usage quirks, because now you're no longer operating it via your eyes and your fingers, but you're operating it via the keyboard oh. on your computer. And so there's this like weird, it's very tough to get around. It's not it is not ideal. Um, so it's one of those that it, it demos somewhat well for like YouTubers trying to get views, but in real life, it's, it's not awesome. As my, my four-year-old daughter says, I did not love that. Um, and <laughs> so you, you then finally get the last category, which is that you can access apps via Safari. So basically anything on a web browser, that's like your lowest common denominator and apps is like quotation marks there. Um, so with that hierarchy set, you've got to look at what's actually available from a fitness standpoint. And if you look at from a fitness uh, apps that are native vision uh, OS apps, there is virtually nothing. There's like a handful of um, like form type stuff for indoor weight training and stuff like that, that uh, core workouts, et cetera, um, and some meditation apps and things along that realm, but very, very little. Um, 
And then in the apps that are left over that companies haven't toggled off um, in our realm of sport and fitness, uh, we do see things like Ruby is allowed. So I downloaded that. Um, Full Gas was allowed. I downloaded that. Um, my Woosh was there. I downloaded that. Uh, but Zwift uh, was toggled off. That was like a last second decision. I talked to them a bunch leading up about this. And uh, by the time I got around to uh, going to install Zwift, it was not there anymore. And I'm still talking about them about that. Uh, it sounds like they're very open to leaving it on, but I think a lot of companies have been afraid of leaving that checkbox on and then users demanding support for it, mm -hmm. um, yep. as opposed to being treated as a, Hey, it's an iPad or an iPhone app that's running on the goggles. Good luck to you. Um, and what I've seen in running apps is there are legit problems. Uh, so I used the ride with GPS app to try to record an outdoor ride. I went riding through trails on this. Um, <laughs> we'll put a bit of a snippet of video here. I've got a, yeah, okay. a longer, a longer video that I'm working on. Um, I'm gonna kind of walk through this whole thing. Um, and I, the reason for this wasn't necessarily entirely clicks and views. It was, I was curious about latency. Um, so people talk about the pass through video. That's the, the headlining feature of this is that it is taking your outside world via these cameras that are on the, the outside of the goggles. And then it's passing that through to the inside lenses. Cause again, it's a, opaque thing in between the outside and the inside. That's not clear glass. You can't see through this. Um, so it has to retransmit that into the inside of the goggles. Uh, and kind of a litmus test for a lot of uh, VR goggles is whether or not you can play ping pong with them, right? Is that yeah. fast enough that people can play ping pong back and forth? And a lot of goggles have gotten to that point these days. Um, and we've seen like with uh, Meta's Quest 3 goggles, they are designed for sport and fitness. They have an entire dedicated page about using them during workouts and how to clean them and stuff like that. Um, Apple basically says don't kind of, but there's actually, if you look at uh, Jerry Rig Everything's video, um, tear down of it, he shows all the things they've done internally to make it a bit more water and sweat resistant than people realize. And you can remove the phone inserts and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Anyways, the point of this side distraction was I went riding outside to see was the reaction time fast enough on trails. Um, I wouldn't call it mountain biking because I didn't bring a mountain bike with me. So I stole my dad's road bike and went on trails that were definitely not designed for road bikes um, and just to make it work. And the answer is it's fast enough. Yes. Um, but the quality level there is not super um, great in lower light conditions. Um, and so in the trails, it became very, very difficult to tell the difference between hard pack sand and soft sand. Uh, and that really mattered to me on a road bike when I really shouldn't have been on either of those two scenarios. Uh, and so I didn't crash at all, thankfully. Um, but it was an interesting exercise. And that's where the app though, from an app standpoint, the ride with GPS app was the app that I used to show my speed. And it was cool. Like I had this gigantic effective heads, like heads three up, screen yeah. headset, yeah, totally, heads up display. Yeah. And so like that that aspect was amazing to totally. have this, you know, ride with GPS app over there. Like that worked ish. Um, I say ish because there's a whole thing on travel mode that we won't even get to here. That's a whole different topic for a whole different day and how the, the headset pins windows to space and time. So yeah. I would pin it and then ride through it. Um, and I couldn't use travel mode here because it, it was too bumpy basically. So detected things were not like on an airplane, which is what it's designed for. So there was lots of caveats to this. Uh, some of them, almost all of them were probably more my fault than, than Apple's fault. But um, from an app standpoint, my, my point I'm finally gonna get to here is that there were pieces of that that you couldn't get to from an eye tracking perspective very easily. Things that weren't designed because it was an iPhone app that was being projected up there with tiny little options that you're like, how do I change that option with my eyes and just tap -dee tap which is how you, you tap -dee tap things. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. so anyways, those are all things that I'll get into in this video that maybe it'll be our podcast up. Probably not, but you never know. <laughs> no, I, you know, in terms of fitness, I, that's obviously the thing that, you know, you and I would think about this first. And I think the potential for a device like this for fitness, oh gosh, I mean, there are so many possible things that you could do with this. That yep. would just be so incredibly cool. This particular device though, I don't think it's intended really much at all for fitness for quite a few reasons. Um, yep. You know, number one, I think it's gonna be the weight. The weight is gonna be yep. a, a big, big factor. I was sitting there only for a 30 minute demo and even at that point, I'm like, wow, I am feeling this thing on my head. I mean, I didn't have the the top strap one or the dual strap. I had just the solo yep. band around the back and I felt it after a while. And, you know, I was think I was trying to think about the use cases, you know, for me. And for me, 
again, this particular device would be an entertainment device uh, for what it currently does. And, you know, even for me sitting around my house, I was thinking about like, all right, if I'm sitting in my living room using this, I would actually probably want to be laying back just so my head is actually propped up because of the weight. That's literally how I would want to use it. And so, you know, thinking about how the headset's supposed to work, though, is that, you know, you can look around and move your head and that would get tiring for me after a while. And, and, you know, just for a little bit of context, like I even used to have a 40 inch, huge 40 inch monitor for my computer. And I downsized to a 32 inch because I didn't want to, you know, move my head around that much. So to move my head around with this plus the extra weight, again, that pretty much eliminates it. The the use case for fitness at that point. Um, And then, the other part of it comes down to the UI and the interactions as well is because, you know, with me, if you've watched any of my videos and you can see me right now, I talk with my hands constantly. So yeah. <laughs> so I was accidentally doing things here and there. So in a fitness scenario, there's a there's so much to work out there. So in terms of why, you know, we're not seeing Zwift or, uh, you know, many other fitness apps or pretty much any other fitness app on here, there's a lot to work out with the UI because the UI, uh, and I actually have to give Apple a ton of credit here, the UI that they made for this in terms of the little handles and the little controls and whatnot specific for yep. this system, uh, f- from somebody who has a UX background and UI background, Oh my gosh, like they they crushed it. They they did such mm-hmm. a great job. But the interface in terms of your eyes and your fingers, that has to be really thought through with a fitness scenario. I think it even needs to be thought through with the way it's current implementation to the rest of the platform. I think for me, the my biggest challenge with it um, outside of the use case is I am I am too fast on a computer for it. So like when friends and family and you've been with me, like I move very, very fast to the computer because that's what I grew up doing, right? And so people are always like, you move so fast, what are you doing? And in this, with Division Pro, my eyes are going faster than I can have it recognize taps. You have to tap everything. So you look at something, tap, look at something, tap. So like entering a passcode in, like I want to enter it in one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And it's like, I can't, it's one, two, three, four, right? And it's it takes long, it takes so long that uh, for me, the device as it today, it's great for watching a, a video on. It's like, oh, wow, this is super cool. But to do other work stuff on there, I haven't found it very practical. Um, like people can have all these windows up like this, right? And you see that and you see, oh, it's amazing you have all these windows up, up, up there. But what you don't realize is that you could only work with one window at a time, right? Because it's tracking your eyes. So you, you can, you can't, glance like you'd have physical monitor you can glance there but you can't interact with that quickly because you've got to look at this bring in a focus connect with that you know with your hands um and then go back to the next window over here the next row it's not it's more challenging than i think some videos make it out to be i think you know in, in youtube or review culture right especially for some of these high profile devices you end up having one camp of fanboyism of like this is amazing the best thing ever anyone that says anything bad sucks right that's they're they're just dumb people and then you have the other camp which is everything's horrible about this device and i think the middle ground is somewhere like closer to it's an amazing device but definitely has some quirks, like some some really hard quirks um, that make it challenging to use on a daily basis for lots of different applications beyond just content consumption of video experiences. You know, this actually goes back to uh, a tweet that Mark Gurman had about the Vision Pro actually quite a while back is that um, he basically said that Apple's Vision Pro chief sees surgery, technical training, and education as the key feature areas for the device. And I think that's that's really where I see this device other than, you know, entertainment because like the entertainment it was in, it was incredible. But in terms of those sort of applications in terms of training, oh gosh, I could see this just oh, being yeah. an amazing tool. Like I mean, you know, just in terms of like uh like a surgery or something like that, you know, simulating yeah. surgery. That would just be absolutely phenomenal. So and even again, in our I realm, think... surgery of of your bike, right? So imagine like an oh, app sure. that sits there and you know, you think of all the different, like from a bike shop perspective, all the different types of components in your bike, 
and trying to have someone understand, do they have a nine speed, a 12 speed cassette, right? You can count that down, but what are they counting? People are going to count the cog going this way or they're going to count the cogs going down. Like mm -hmm. imagine an app that's smart enough to recognize bike parts and has a catalog of millions of bike parts can say, here's how you fix this item on your bike while you're wearing the goggles and literally highlights the exact part untwist this here now take this out like amazing things could happen with this um mm -hmm. down the road as app developers leverage it yeah totally now let's talk about the price and this is really why i did not walk out the door with one if it was <laughs> if this was a thousand dollars i would have walked out the door with it sure if it was two thousand dollars probably not but the apple vision pro starts at thirty five hundred dollars and plus x plus tax, plus your carrying case, which is 200 bucks plus, and you know, that's like the lowest storage version. Now- Mine's in a pair of gym shorts, by the way. I'm surprised it's not in a plastic bag or a paper bag. I, I thought about it, but I wanted, I wanted to protect it a bit. So I put it in a pair of, of $10 running shorts um, across <laughs> the country in my bag. <laughs> Still there. Now, okay. <laughs> now, okay. So getting to, to that whole price. So we all know that Apple products, you know, there's there's a certain premium price that you have to pay for an Apple yep. product. Now, there's I think there's a lot of factors that go into this. First of all, the hardware really is amazing. Like it is constructed really well. You can see that there's tons of thought that goes into it. Very high quality hardware. I think another thing I would bring up would be the the actual UI and the interaction. Again, that takes a lot of software development to, to happen. And then lastly, the demo that they actually had for this too, because like they are, they're investing a lot of money into the actual demo experience of this too. And I thought it was actually really cool. Um, first of all, you know, you, you have to sign up for a demo through apple.com and you basically get a 30, 30 minute demo at an Apple store. And the uh, gentleman who helped me out with my demo, first of all, he did just such a great job. Like he just like nailed the presentation, mm -hmm. everything like that. And they even had this like special iPad with this like special interface where they can actually guide you through the whole process. Did you not do the demo at the Apple I haven't store? Done, you, no, no, I just, just, I just oh. showed up at the door. No, he, I, seriously, it is, it's like a concierge type experience that they have for you okay. here so yeah they'll basically sit they'll basically sit you down um, at the table they'll sit right next to you they have an ipad mini there with this special interface that they can see what you're seeing and they have yep. all these like stats of different things of whatever's where, whatever's going on and they basically guide you through the experience and it is it was a it was such a great experience but again that costs money too so thirty five hundred dollars it's, I mean, it's a ton of money, but at the yep. same time, there's a lot that goes into this thing. And it's hard for me to justify as a consumer, uh, but I do see where a lot of that money goes, is how I put it. Yeah, definitely. I think it's 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 a very, very high price for the, the use cases. I, I can understand from a hardware standpoint how you get there. Like I think about what a what cameras cost right for example and the amount of components in some uh mirrorless etc type cameras right and you go well i suspect there's more expensive components in vision pro than that camera but yeah i don't i don't know if i'm going to keep mine i, I don't have a easy way of of returning it so i i probably just would sell it here instead um which shouldn't be a problem uh but it's one of those uh, i looked at it and i was optimistic when I first ordered it, that um, we would see more sport and fitness apps out there um, in some way, shape, or form uh, leveraging it, even just initially. Uh, and then over time, that would grow. Um, but based on kind of, and one of the things that Apple really held back on publicizing any details on sweat protection or anything like that until not the night before it, it started shipping, but the morning it started shipping after 8 a.m. I even looked before 8 a.m. Eastern and they were not there at all. And those only lit up at roughly 8 a.m. the first time you could have got um, units, uh, you know, in the mail, et cetera. So they really held back on that. So you really didn't know, like, what's the sweat protection level? Is it going to be like the the MetaQuest 3 where it's, you know, totally fine for sweating? Or is it going to be something that's not fine for sweating? And this definitely is Apple saying it's more not fine for sweating than, than not. So uh, for my use cases, you know, I'm going to finish what I'm doing here. I might play with it a little longer and then I'll probably uh, look to to find someone in Amsterdam that wants to buy it um, because I just don't, I don't really have a, a clear use case for it that I was hoping that would be there going forward. I'm happy to have my mind changed um, if I can, you know, find some use for it. Uh, but like, if I look at my world as one 
can I justify it from a entertainment usage something standpoint? Like kind of like you're saying, like, is there some scenario where I'm like, oh, I can justify this by itself? And the answer is no. Then the next question is, can I justify it like from a business ROI perspective, right? And like making views on YouTube, et cetera. And as we said earlier, like simple maths to here says that I have to have a video that gets roughly 350 or so thousand views. And yeah, I think there's, there's certainly viability to make this happen over the course of a year or so of, of viewage, et cetera. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that makes sense in terms of my overall budget as a business. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm interested to see how, I think the, like, as I said, somewhere else, the, the concept of vision pro and vision as a, as a product, um, undoubtedly will succeed long-term for Apple. Um, for me as a general consumer, I'm not seeing a use case today. Um, for me as a techie, that's super cool. I just wait for those two things to merge into one. Right. And that's where I think you'll see that mass market adoption. Well, I think you have to apply also the fact that, you know, not only you are you a normal consumer as well as a techie, but your life surrounds sports. And we've talked about this definitely before is that, you know, when you look at a price of a product for you and I, like specifically, we look at like, or that could be a sweet trip to France for a week or two. Oh, and yeah. Yeah. And I guess this brings up another thing for me, too, is that, you know, being more into sports and fitness and more about experiences more than mm -hmm. things. The reason I've never tried one of these devices before is because I don't want to feel disconnected to the world. Yep. And I think yeah. this device is cool just in the sense that you have the pass through, you can actually see what people are doing. They can see your eyes as well, you know, in, in certain oh, yeah. scenarios, but you, you can go ride a bike <laughs> with it, which you shouldn't, by the way, everyone. Yeah. No, please I don't. Uh, Apple, Apple like hints at not doing it on the, on the goggles when you try, right? They're like, you yeah. shouldn't be operating a, a vehicle. I'm like, what's the definition of a vehicle? Um, <laughs> and then if you go onto their site and it says very clearly, like if you dig down on support articles, which I don't think most consumers are going digging down on support articles, but it does say there, like, do not ride a bicycle. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, like, and so to be clear, I did ride a bicycle in a place that there was no one around, like literally <laughs> The thing I was most concerned about hitting was a uh, Florida Panther, a Bobcat, and a Gator. Like those were the legit three things I had to avoid on this ride. Not not other humans, thankfully. Um, so uh, <laughs> yeah, don't go riding it out on the streets of of whatever, and don't drive a car yeah. with it, or all those other things that are just dumb. And the reason why, by the way, you shouldn't do that. Um, and this actually legitimately happened, and I was recording it. And this is why it happened. Um, I wasn't recording on external camera, but as I was going down the trail at a really good clip because I was done like shooting some other stuff and I was like I'm just gonna gonna go with it now um the whole screen went black like literally I am flying along the trail and the whole thing just goes whoop, black and I'm like ah! and I hit the brakes really quick it stopped and then it went back to to light again and it took me a while to figure out what it was it was actually the screen recording stopping I had screen recording on you could oh. screen record the goggles view and for whatever mm -hmm. reason at 53 minutes the screen recording ended and when the screen recording ends the whole goggles go black for like it felt like a really long time. My guess is it may have only been half a second or a second or who knows what, but it was enough that when you're mountain biking that you're like, this is the problem <laughs> real quick. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, but you imagine like, again, it's, you're not, you're, it's, it's not a glass thing. Like you're literally yeah. having a glass. Yes. But it's not, it's not a transparent object. So when the technology shuts off, if the power is off, you're in darkness. Um, mm -hmm. and that's why you should not use it in those, those environments. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see, uh, see where it all goes. In terms of technology that I've experienced lately, they have there's two things that come to mind. This is probably the coolest thing that I've tried in many, many years. Interestingly, the other cool, really cool piece of technology that I recently tried was the Wahoo Kicker Run. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, those are I would Which, say those are probably the tech coolest tech things in a while. Yeah. So I mean, you know, you're talking thirty five hundred dollars for this or five thousand dollars for that. You know, my money's yeah. going. Yeah, but again, we're biased, I guess you could say, in, in that matter, yeah. because this is a sports tech channel. I could basically see renting one of these. Like, if I could go, you know, rent one for, like, a weekend or something like that, that would be awesome. And then or I'd online? be... How much How much are uh, talking to her? I can, I can rent your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I got cut you a deal. I got a deal for you. <laughs> yeah, I could definitely a thousand see... thousand bucks you know, a weekend? That work? 
<laughs> remember like remember uh back in like the the uh blockbuster days where you could actually like rent a vcr or like rent a blu-ray yeah. player or something holy like cow that. you're right i forgot yeah. about that that exactly. was a long time so, ago. yeah yeah so yeah. like yeah so if yep. i could like rent one of these yep i i would love to see something like that um and that would work perfect for me but lastly let's let's talk about burritos Cool. Burrito sounds good. I've got nine minutes and 34 seconds left on this SD card as an FYI. So we're going to okay. have to keep a burrito consumption to a relative minimum here. So so burritos. Uh, we started this off, uh, not we, the, the royal we. Um, Strava and Chipotle uh, started a competition uh, at the beginning of January where essentially they had six segments that started or ended at uh, Chipotle stores in the U.S. and uh, L.A., New York, um, Chicago, Colorado, Ohio, and Washington, D.C. Um, and these are roughly 300 meter long segments uh, for running. And the, the simple goal here is the most repeats of that segment won. And they won a year's worth of supply of Chipotle, um, which is technically classified as 52 weeks worth of meals. Um, and so you choose what you want there, but you get basically one, one uh, meal per week or the, the value of one meal per week, essentially. Um, and this was building on Strava's local legends feature. So the idea that you just, the most repeats wins. Doesn't matter how fast you win, the fast times did not matter at all. It was purely the most most attempts. Uh, and so things got off to a hot start in Colorado and in, in Denver there um, with uh, what were effectively just a bunch of university runners um, that were like repeat after repeat. Like on day one, they threw down, I don't know, 30 or 40 loops of this thing. Uh, and, you know, some of the routes were were pretty decent. The Colorado one was actually a pretty decent route mm-hmm. in the grand scheme yeah, of things. So it wasn't that horrible. Area. Yep. Yep. Um, basically, a residential street, so it actually wasn't bad at all. Right. Re- it's the original Chipotle, by the way. That was kind of notable mm-hmm. on that one. Um, the LA one was really clean along the beach. Some of the routes were horrific. Um, the New York City one was bad, but the Washington, D.C. one was arguably the worst possible place you could think to run. Uh, it crossed three different intersections along a 300-meter stretch, major roads in downtown Washington, D.C. It's like, that was the worst Chipotle you could have chosen. Um, but... People did this over the last month, and that all ended on January 31st uh, after this. And we saw, I think the top one was about 1,100 repeats um, of a segment. Uh, insanity in terms of some of these And segments. that was in Colorado, right? So uh, the top was actually, I think, Washington, D.C., of all things. Um, oh, was it? A okay. guy did it there. Uh, New York was at, uh, I think, just over 1,000, just under 1,000. Uh, let me pull up the whole list here. Hold on. Here we go. Yeah, I'd even try it, by the way. Like, I live probably only... I, I live about 35 to 40 minutes from the original Chipotle store. And yep. um, I, I basically... If I lived a lot closer, I would have probably tried. But um, it was just too far away for me to make repeated and, you know, attempts at this. Yeah, so the top overall was uh, Washington, D.C. with 1,345 repeats, uh, which is insane. Uh, and each one of these winners, each one of these cities got their own winner. So you didn't compete against other cities. Uh, and then there was, um, so Colorado was down at uh, 1,041 uh, repeats. <laughs> and then New York at 832 repeats. Uh, Chicago at uh, 613 repeats. Keep in mind, Chicago had some horrendous weather in there. So that, that definitely slowed things down. Um, and then you work your way down to LA. Yeah, at this a is the story. 300 and 69 repeats uh and it was like huh that was that was interesting uh, i'll be low but not, <laughs> not. and so i started <laughs> digging into this I, I had pulled all these numbers the night before because i was i was concerned about one sneak attack is that this was only applicable to public activities so i was concerned that this the clever smart devious person would basically rack up all of these private segments mm. behind the scenes and then uh-huh. on january 31st at like 10 p.m they'd be like boom pop up pop up pop up, up, up all the way across the board and then blow up the leaderboard right i was concerned someone might do that uh, and no one did that it sounded like there was some minor stuff around that but not enough to impact the leaderboards or near it however on the la one i'm like that's weird the strava segment leaderboard is showing like five people at the top with exactly 369 things so i'm like oh, that that can't be right because some of these people I look at them and they haven't run this segment in weeks and it just didn't make much sense to me. And I'm like, ah, I don't know what's going on here, but whatever. I'm just going to, there's one guy that appears to be people are congratulating. So this guy must be the winner. Um, and at that point I just did my post and published it. And then I got some, some DMS and text messages from these people. And they're like, well, let me tell you what really happened. Uh, they basically, <laughs> 
colluded together uh, to agree to stop at 369 attempts because there was a clause in the rule that if there was a tie, all winners for that segment got the rule. Um, and these people even had the burrito balls to email the Strava PR team under like a fake name or something and be like, what happens if there's more than two people? Do we all get it? And they said, yes, everyone gets it. And so this group of people that didn't know each other, I think there was like two that knew each other from the gym. The rest used Strava's new DM direct messaging feature that came out a few months ago to DM each other and be like, look, do you really want to do this any longer? We can all just stop and agree to stop at 369 and we'll all get it. And so here is five people from different walks of life that didn't know each other that all agreed to stop at 369 where they were well above anyone else because everyone else gave up immediately. Um, and they all got a year's worth of Chipotle. Like, it's absolutely hilarious. That is a work smarter, not harder sort of scenario right there. So amazing. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping we see this again. I hope we see it in more cities internationally. There's there's Chipotle's in London and Paris, for example. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a cool it's a cool thing. Like, it's one of those, somebody complained about, oh, another, another you know, commercialization of Strava. Like, look, Strava's been commercialized for a decade in terms of challenges. Um, and usually you just get, like, a little icon. You get burritos, like all good. Um, yeah. so I think it's, it's a cool little promotion. Um, good job. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. And, and there's, there's other promotions too. Like, uh, like what we were mentioning earlier, like I competed in a Chipotle consistent consistency challenge or something like that. And got a free, you yeah. know, guac coupon. So definitely sign up for those challenges. So, so yeah, that's going to wrap up this week's episode of the fit file podcast. So next week kind of, uh, grab bag of things that we're going to talk about. Um, we yep. did not talk about winter training last week or this week because we had extra stuff to talk about. I think we're going to bring that up next week. And we also are going to respond to some user questions that have come from the internet. So feel free to hit us up on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, to ask us certain questions that you want to, uh, certain topics that you want to have covered on it, the podcast. Comment and we section will, below as well too. Yeah, to give us some extra topics to talk about that are going to be really interesting. So yeah, anything else from you this week, Ray? No, I think that that's it. We've got two minutes and 22 seconds left. So I think we're uh, cutting it thin. Good to, to, to wrap it tight before the SD card corrupts and we lose things. Yep, so, all right. Awesome. Well, thank everyone for, uh, for listening. Uh, appreciate it and uh, see you next week. See ya.